deck. It's been kind of the deck of the tournament. Going across the board, we actually see a lot of red here. Dom Harvey is on burn, so we have two red decks here. Autumn Burchett, third on their team here. Looks like is playing Teamer Delver. On their side, we have Jonathan Job, also on Delver. We have a Delver Mirror. Paul Muller is, I would hope. He's not playing Storm. No, he is well, on. A, he is on an Urza. Not a he's on Storm. He's on the. He's on outcome. But Paradox, the outcome Urza deck. Right. So we. All right. So we are underway. However, with our game, Aaron Barrich going to start out things here with Fervent Champion, and begins the curve out. We'll see. Certainly with. Uh, we'll see whether or not Brian can keep pace. His deck does not do much early on. Yeah, this is the spot where. Basoko just needs to have things to do in the first couple of turns to kind of create any form of wall that he can. So this having him having a growth spiral here, this is one of the defining cards in this matchup. Just because it actually lets him get out onto the battlefield faster. As Rimrock Knight and Fervent Champion. Knight just cast as a three one by Aaron. Well the No nice Adventures. Thing, you see uh, Fervent Champion, the Javier Dominguez card. It pumps knights. And wouldn't you know it, Fervent Knight is a knight. Rimrock Knight is a knight. Okay, Rimrock can, knight can keep going. Hold on, I think I'm getting right, it. Right, so Fervent Champion pumping knights All right. is going to pump the creature with knight in its name. I see. It's, this seems like a good combo. Right, no, it's, it's quite good for someone trying to reduce their opponent's life total to zero. So here's a swing in. That pump you mentioned is going to happen. So this is an attack for five. It's the third attack with Fervent Champion, so that should p put Brian down to... Well, I would have said 13, except he's gained some life. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, 15. That yeah, those life gain come into play tap plans. Those really add up if you have multiples. Light up the stage here with Spectacle. Two yards here. Aaron passes the turn. Back to Brian we go. He did a turn two growth spiral. Oh, is that, is that an untapped land? If it is, we might see a Golos. Ooh, that's our big, big thing here. And that is going to be the play. Golos, 4-4 blocker. Going to continue the ramp for Brian. It's 5-5 five, five here. Going to bring, bring the land into play. And this is... And more life gain. Right. This yeah. is, it's more life gain. It's getting closer to... Field of the Dead actually putting two twos onto the battlefield, and it's a three five on its own. It's just stonewalling Aaron's entire battlefield here. There's a lot of things we see. Tranquil Co. This is three life gain lands already in play for Brian. Starting at twenty three kind of offsets the fact that he was behind a turn at the beginning. With right. between a growth spiral and these gain life lands. He's really in a good spot here. Yeah, I mean, it all seems incidental, but then when your opponent starts playing cards like Fervent Champion, then they become really relevant. Ooh. So this is the card you mentioned, kind of the linchpin of the mono red deck. Right, so this is Torbran, Thane of Redfell. This is something that's going to make all of Aaron's creatures worth even more damage than they would have been otherwise. So Fervent Champion is swinging for three, more or less. And then the Rimrock Knight is for six. Right. So this is a spot where Aaron's basically saying, yeah, you get to kill my Fervent Champion for free, but you're going to go to eight to do it. And you see, yeah, Brian just can't do it. So he will trade Golos with the Rimrock Knight. As a matter of fact, I will not go to eight to yeah. do that. <laughs> Goes down to 11. Now... Land seven, he's going to start getting 2-2 two, two blockers. This still might be okay for Brian. He had a good ramping start. Right, and this is a spot where Fervent Champion can actually attack into zombies because it has first strike. Right. So when you combine that with Torbran, this could end up... It's really close. Yeah. Plaza of Harmony for Brian. Reaches for some night tokens. or some zombie tokens. And does he have the two gates for Plaza as well? No, I don't believe so. Despite feeling like it, those enter the battlefield yeah, tap lands are not actually gates. Arboreal Grazer will put a gate into play. Get him another zombie. 
Last cards are a Krasis and another Grazer. So he's going to Krasis for four. That'll put him back up to 13, draw him two more cards. All right, this certainly plays. Having a 4-4 four -four is something that actually can stonewall this fervent champion. Back to Aaron we go. She will attack. So this is a 1-1. One, one. It Right on the board, it looks like the Krasis well, could block. Well, so this Castle Ember throws it off because it gives an additional power to all of Aaron's creatures if she wants. Oh. And now a lot of damage here we saw receive. Aaron, she's going to basically use the whole hand here. One out spectacle is triggered. Oh, yeah. Slaying fire, skewer the critics. Let's go. Total of 11 damage and burn because of Torbrand. That's <laughs> yeah, all of it upstairs. Ignore the oh, creatures. Yeah. Brian down to two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you start one red to deal five, seems pretty nice. Never met an Arboreal Grazer that mattered. And this is where I, what I like is the fact that Bant, all these ramp decks, as ramp decks generally are, don't play removal. And because of that, something like Torban's just sitting around is pretty gross. Right. That's the draw to a card like that here is it's honestly better than Furnace of Wrath for yeah. a lot of these one damage pings that come across. And we're going to see a sweeper here. Brian swings in and then going to have to clean up the board, but he's at two. Uh, this is a tight spot. I mean, it's scary against Red. Two life is not much. All right. Arboreal Grazer. That's a blocker. Has a zombie. Well. Shock. That's, <laughs> that, uh, that is a, the correct number of damage. What can, what can we say? So Aaron, she takes the win here. In game number one with Mono Red Aggro. That's interesting. She was on, I believe, the draw as well that game. That sounds correct. Yeah, I yeah. actually believe that to be true. On the draw. And this was through a lot of these life gain lands. And it, it shows a card like Torbrand that's just going to be worth so much more damage than I think most like red cards would convert for Right, here. that was four mana and was probably worth around eight damage that game. Yeah, Something I mean it forced like some... It forced, Ten maybe? It forced, first of all, forced a trade of the Golos, exactly. which is pretty... That's important. Yeah, exactly. So that was two. Yeah. It gave two more to the Fervent Champion twice. Two to two burn spells. So that's eight plus a flavorable trade. It's a pretty yeah. good card. Oh, absolutely love it. So, and first result in, and that's with Aaron's deck. So we look toward the sideboards. On Brian Basoko's side, a lot of these cards in the sideboard are rather expensive, which makes me think he doesn't want them here. Yeah, this is a spot where those cards are basically because he's playing Fae of Wishes in the main deck and wants to have access to all these bullets. The assumption with a ramp deck is you're just going to kind of get to cast whatever you want. So you get to right. play all these cards that are situational and very powerful when you end up wishing for them. These are your things like March of the Multitudes, Unmoored Ego, etc. But against Red... Aaron's kind of capitalizing on the fact that people just aren't interacting for the first two, three, four turns of the game. That's something I'm actually interested in as to whether or not Brian wants to move some of these bullets to the main. Say something like March of the Multitudes, which can be good in this matchup. I'm not sure that he has time to wish for it with Fae of Wishes. If he's paying the four man to go get it, that might just be too slow. And if that's true, does he move it into the main? So think about it this way. A lot of the time, Basoko probably is not even going to be wishing because Fae of Wishes is just a two-mana 1-4, one one which is yeah. actually pretty good against a red deck. I mean, Aaron, she is playing a two-mana 3-1, so okay. Yeah, yeah two-mana exactly. 1-4 is nice. Exactly, and for that reason, we're probably going to even see the bullets that are good against Aaron's deck come into Basoko's deck. Yeah. Now, on Aaron's side... I mean, I like where she's at in the main. I have to think after seeing that game that I she sh that I wouldn't be surprised if she boards all the way up to four Torbran. Yeah, Torbran's quite good when you're expecting the opponent to not have much removal. Tybalt's pretty nice against things like Hydrid Crisis, some of the gain life lands. But for the most part, she's just trying to go under what Basoko is doing. Right, it's these problematic permanents, these cards that, that just stick around that are so good here because Brian doesn't remove them. Exactly. You know, a 1-4 sounds like it would be good against red, but when you have things that you actually need to answer, like Torbrand, that, that isn't going to cut it. Those of you watching us on Twitch.tv, thanks for watching our channel. We, uh, 
you can join us here in the Feature Match area with our Twitch subscription program. So you get access to our emoticons, you get access to some badges. Also, you can help vote on the matches you want to see tomorrow when we get into the elimination rounds of all of our tournaments. It's definitely an uphill battle from, for Basoko here. This is not the kind of matchup that his list is tuned to beat. And last game, he effectively started at 23, had a growth spiral into right. a Golos. He had the draw. It was It's very rough from him. Yeah, life gain lands into growth spiral into Golos into large hydroid crisis. That what more sounds can like for? against red, that's what you want. Right. Simic Guild Gate is a start. Now our Boreal Grazer puts Tranquil Cove into play. Basoko to 21. Hallowed Fountain. Aaron did not have a one drop here. And she has runaway Steamkin. Just a 1-1 one -one right now. He's going to try to crash through that Grazer at some point. Interesting to see what Brian's hand has going on. You see another Grazer in it, which O3s are great in this matchup, but he has to make sure there's a payoff at the end of all of this. Well, against Red, sometimes just gaining three life is kind of a payoff. Sure, just block, jump blocking? Yeah, it's not something that you're ever excited about, but if you stay above zero, then that's fine. On modern, Brian's teammate Paul Muller combos off here, wins the game one with Urza outcome. <coughs> For Brian, circuitous route gets him up to six mana. Just looks like three cards left in hand. We'll see if he well, does have a payoff. So we saw a Fae of Wishes. Because Aaron's pretty slow getting out of the gates here, we yeah. might just actually see some wishing happen. It might work out. Yeah, yeah, even without some of the big stuff that you wouldn't think to board in. Some of them can just put the the game away. These are things like Ethereal Absolution. Couldn't yeah. be being incredible here. Trapper Brian is a, a third Arboreal Grazer. Listen... He they got long arms, and they are reaching their way into Basoko's hand. They can just they can just grab hands, make a circle. <laughs> Fae of Wish is going to go on an adventure. See what it finds. Last turn, Erin made a second runaway Steamkin. She missed her third land drop. But two Steamkins sometimes can make it so that you really don't need many lands. Yeah, absolutely. This is a spot where as long as Erin can just play a couple yeah. of more red spells from here, she kind of just gets to go off. Get to look over Brian's as he's digging through his sideboard here to see just how he's boarded. You see all the Teferi Time Ravelers hanging out in the sideboard, along with a couple Circuitous routes were also boarded out here. It may just, the assumption here is likely that getting extra turns in the game is a similar effect to what Circuitous Route would be doing, but things like Prison Realm aren't just going to be rotting cardboard in your hand. See what he wants to do. Yeah, that Divine Visitation looks to, is what he's picking right now. And that's going to be what he goes with. So 2-2 two, two zombies are nice. 4-4 four, four Sarah Angels are nicer. <laughs> quite the card evaluation <laughs> skills you've got there. There we go. That's the plan. That's why we play this card. Boom. That's it. He doesn't have a way to make tokens on the battlefield yet. So we see Skewer the Critic stranded in Barrett's hand with a 1-4 and an 0-3 on Basoko's <laughs> side of the battlefield. This is... Yeah, she can't spectacle it yet. Right. This is, this is pretty rough. She picks up a land this turn. Ideally, she'd get enough counters, you know, she'd want to get this chain reaction going with the Steamkins. Right, you want to try and cast two spells this turn in order to let the first Steamkin cast another spell, which then lets this other Steamkin start casting yeah. spells. Runaway is a good, good card right. name for this. Yeah, as long as you have enough mana, the Steamkins have the effect of making all your red spells cost one less. Right. Which, once you have two of them, is great. You should be able to cast your entire hand, but you need that... Initial start. Exactly. So you're thumbing a Chandra Acolyte of Flame to the front of her hand here. That is going to be the play. Counters on both Steamkins. Now Chandra doesn't actually have much it can do this turn. It really feels like Aaron is lining things up for the for turn four. Yeah, this is likely just going to come across for a couple of points of damage this turn. 
Right, both Steamkins can swing in. That's safe. Chandra can bring some elementals along with. So, Brian takes the free blocks, takes two damage, goes to 19. This is going to enable a ton of spectacle cards next turn. Yeah. The issue is that Fey of Wishes does put a damage on a runaway Steamkin. So it would die immediately if Aaron then removed the counters. Right. So she's heavily incentivized to try and do all of that pre-combat. Okay. Seventh land for Basoko, but no copy of Field of the Dead. He's going to send Chandra to the prison realm. Gets to scry one. Ooh, this yeah. blast zone's going to have the ability to go after runaway Steamkins here in a moment. And on Brian's side, it really just is Field of the Dead that he's looking for. Right. Or something that finds it. Golos would be great here as well. Oh, Golos would be absolutely incredible. We see that Basoko even has the Black Source with that Golgari Guildgate that he drew last turn. So he could find a Red Source, maybe really start to go off with it. Back to Aaron, see she's going to do some math here. Six cards in hand. Two Steamkins. Possible that she can cast all six cards. Yeah, this is the spot where you're kind of thinking to yourself, okay, I know it's going to happen somehow. All right. Takes care of the blocker. Puts counters on the creatures. Okay, and not discarding cards to put Fey of Wishes back in his hand is a sign that Blast Zone is what he is prioritizing yeah. his mana on this turn. So we know there are a couple of Arboreal Grazers that Basoko would love to turn into different cards at this point. Yeah, I was going to say, that's letting the Fey hit the graveyard was a big cost. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The goal here, roll up Blast Zone to two, and then sacrifice it to get these Steamkins off the battlefield. So that was Slaying Fire. The block with the Arboreal Grazer. No damage on the Steamkin, so now Aaron gets to make some plays post-combat. It's time to float some red mana. She'll start with three red. Down to two to cast light up the stage. Whoa. Counters on both. It's time to go off. Two lands. So she'll start by making another castle Embrith. Still two red mana floating. You can see here that was from the first Seamkin. She's going to make it five. Tybalt sends her back down to two mana. Counters back on Steamkins. Shortcutting a little bit there. Right. Scorch Spitter. So now Steamkins are ready to go, and here's Skewer the Critics. And see here, Aaron actually could have made more mana with a Steamkin, but she declined. It kind of makes me think she's ready to park these Steamkins at 4-4s. Four oh, yeah. This is something that forces Basoko to actually commit his mana to the Blast Zone on the next turn. Yeah. Or even just make Basoko do it on his turn in order to avoid her having six additional mana in order to activate Castle Embriths the following turn. And I like this from Aaron. She's very careful not to put any cards into play which had converted mana cost two. We made a three, she made a one, she made a zero. Right. So now Brian does clean up the two drops with his blast zone. Gonna get some blockers into play. At least one grazer. Is it gonna be two? It is not. And Aaron going to go ahead and take care of the blocker. Shoots through it, attacks on in. Call that the Searing Blaze. Love it. Brian oh. down to 10. Here's five <laughs> mana. Is it Divine Visitation? It is. <laughs> is that a March of the Multitudes in his hand? <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> and it, more, also importantly, first of all, yes. Uh, goodness. We see Field of the Dead. And... I don't see any matching cards, so I believe we get an angel token here. And it is. It's a 4-4, four, four, and you're right. March of the Multitudes is in hand, but Brian needs to survive the turn. Oh. And we'll see if he can. It's a that Torbran is the card oh, he needs. Wow, and that even makes Scorch Spitter's trigger worth more damage. Right. So Scorch Spitter, when it attacks, it deals one. So now it deals three. So 
Job down or Basoko down to seven. Ooh. And even if he blocks and makes a, ho- a bunch of angels, he's taking a three on the combat step <sighs> next turn. So I guess the, the angel has to go in front of Scorch Spitter. Right, and then you need to find a way to deal with these devil tokens that isn't killing them, or you need to get Torbran off the battlefield before then. Yeah, because they're going to attack for... Th- they will deal three damage no matter what. Exactly. It's actually funny. The March of the Multitudes that's in Brian's hand, he kind of... The Divine Visitation's <laughs> messing this up. Well, luckily, Tybalt has that covered, too. Oh, Sometimes you just have it off. Well, Brian gonna take another three. Down to four he goes. And we're back to him. March of the Multitudes the card in his hand, but that is not gonna be a winning card. The Angel Token, remember they have Vigilance, so he for free gets to attack down the, the Tybalt. <gasps> makes a land, it's Plaza oh. of Harmony, and that's going to gain three, right? Does he have two gates? Yes. He does. That was a huge draw. All right, so he's going to end up staying at seven after last turn. Yeah, he went down to four on the attack, and now he's back at seven. Gets right, an angel. Right, That last card, and, and Aaron doesn't that know. That might it. actually be what he needed. Right. She doesn't know that it's March of the Multitudes, and even if she does, I don't know what she does about it. <laughs> right, right. You can't exactly play around it. No. A skewer of the critics, though. Any burn <gasps> spell from Aaron should do it. It's oh, a land, and it's, 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 she's wow. going to be one short. It does look like that's going to be the case. I can't imagine that Aaron survives an attack. All right, so she is at 20 currently? So uh, before damage, Brian is going to make one, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven angels. Okay. Any, anybody's game. Seven Sarah angels at instant speed. Uh, he will block. And that Plaza of Harmony oh was so gosh. important. Yeah, and Eric, she can get him to one, but that's not going to do it. Oh. Brian forces game three. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out to be oh. a close one. Yeah, Brian hangs on thanks to some clutch life gain. Good grief. Wow. And that's kind of what he, his deck needs to get through something like Torbran. This, it's, it's so strong. This puts Aaron's entire team backs against the wall. No one can give up anything else or the match is over and Basoko's team will win the entire right. match. It just takes one more game win. On the other side, though, as Erin loses that one, her teammate Dominic Harvey in the modern seat picks up a win. So they both force a game three. Okay. Meanwhile, on Legacy, the team of Elvermeer still in game two. So Divine Visitation turned out to be the card that Brian went to here. I mean, it was strong, but it does feel pretty slow. It is, and a lot of that was just he had four extra mana on the turn. He was going to cast Fey of Wishes anyway. So you just put the extra card in your hand for free. Okay. Send Fae of Wishes on an adventure, then cast it from exile, and you have a Divine Visitation stapled to your 4-4. Congratulations. Enjoy your extra card. Okay. And in this case, that extra card was enough to put the game out. Certainly gave, it a, gave that win a fla- certain flashiness to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely was. How does Pasoko ever not lose this game into, oh, that might actually happen into, oh my god, Basoko has done it. It was just back and forth. Every single draw set mattered there at the very end. Quick shuffle here then for game three. Now Aaron is going to get to be on the play for the third game. This is the first time that she's been on the play the whole match. Right. I think we've seen before... She's got, certainly on the curve, a speed advantage here. Being on the play is going to make that harder. But I still really feel like the advantage in both these games has been Torbran. You yeah. know, Brian has stabilized some, has gotten to 
to six mana with some pretty high life totals both games. And then what happens is Aaron casts a Torbran and starts, you know, Scorch Spitter, three on the attack, take three more. A Devil Token dies, take three. Yeah, absolutely. It turns everything from gut shots into lightning bolts. Yeah. Perfect champion into Runaway Steamkin for Aaron. She All has right. Basoko down to 18 to start That's things the curve. off. Actually, 19 life gain lands again. <laughs> And this time we see a really powerful ramp start here. It's Arboreal Grazer into a castle. He also has next turn lined up with a Circuitous Route. It's going to be powerful. I, I like playing Arboreal Grazer here over the Growth Spiral. We can see hanging out in hand, I believe. That might be a Fabled Passage, actually. But even if it were less mana efficient, it does gain more life in this sense when he already knows how his mana is going to be spent next turn. Exactly. Uh-oh. Oh, swing in for one and a light up the stage from Aaron. She gets her, makes her land drop. Gets a removal spell here and most importantly gets Torbrand in exile for next turn. Torbrand's hiding out. She has the fourth land in her hand. Everyone knows what's about to happen. Yeah, and I like how she timed here. First strike happened with Fervent Champion, then she lit up the stage. And with one of the two cards, she got off light up the stage. There was the Rimrock Knight, which can be used as a combat trick. That removed the Grazer. Right. Well, so Cutis Root from Basoko. That gets him up to two more lands. He doesn't have a Field of the Dead yet. Well, and he's going to take a lot of damage next yeah, turn. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is... Uh, normally, you, you kind of don't mind taking a turn off because you assume whatever you do on seven mana is going to be great, right. but it's got to be real yeah. great. And Aaron's play is on the board. She's going to cast Torbran attack here. That's for <laughs> uh, nine. Is that all? That is half. <coughs> and now she has some mana post-combat to do oh. something with. Oh, good grief. Brian is going to need a sweeper. Now, Aaron just passes. She doesn't have any follow -up Oh, yeah, here. there's lethal on the battlefield. Fair enough. You don't need to commit more into something like a sweeper if you don't have to. Seven lands. Here for Basoko. Oof, Roam Cloak yep. Giant killing all non giant okay. creatures. Oh, should have played That's the Bone Carpet Yeah, there giant. was the, the giant that was off on an adventure. Oh, no. <laughs> Aaron, and I like this. All Skewer right. the Critics upstairs is going to do it. So, two to one, Aaron Barrich is the winner here with Mono Red. She shows off how Torbran is so powerful here, all three uh. games. <coughs> Yeah, that was a fine turn. That was unbelievable. And that's exactly why you bring Mono Red to this type of event, is when everyone else is just not interacting, trying really hard to go over the top of one another constantly, you go low when they go high. So, one win for the Red Deck. We're going to go over to the modern seat, where Dom Harvey is playing against Paul Muller. Now, this one, we do, we're going to get life totals in a second here, but... It doesn't look great for Dom unless Paul is at actually three. Well, it's always tough because it never looks good for Burn on the battlefield after, like, the second turn. <laughs> That's not really what the deck's about. Right. So, you know, maybe Muller is actually at three here. Okay. But he's not at three. It's significantly higher. All right. So, I would like to add an addendum to my previous <laughs> statement. <laughs> Boros Charm. Upstairs. Should deal four. Skullcrack. These, are, I believe, are prowess Ooh. triggers. So Boros Charm, Skullcrack, Paul down to seven. Looks like four triggers on the Swift Spear. We'll get an accurate count here on the damage. But it's not lethal, and Dom is out of cards. Well... Depending on how much damage that was from the Swift Spear, that can be significant. Ooh. That was, yeah, it was. So what do we have? We have 14 down to, down to 10 off the Boros Charm, 7 off the Skull Crack. It was a 5-power Swift Spear, so that is 2. So now 
Dominic Harvey's playing to the top of the deck. Okay, so as long as there's a block for this Construct token, Harvey's very likely still in this game. You just got to hope that you right. find that burn spell off the top. This is exactly how modern burn always works. Right, yeah, you play as close as you can. And especially because it's only two damage, um, the land in play is just worth a card. That's <gasps> free. Oh, wow. Paradoxical outcome. This is outcome. so many cards. Yeah, now the question is, does does Dominic get another turn? There is a, there's a construct that does not have summoning sickness. Oh. And... Paul is drawing a lot of cards here. Oh, that was a Sahili off the top. That's going to do it. That's okay. going to let this Thopter that's been in play for a turn become a copy of that construct. Sure. Here's the land. We'll see if Paul goes that way with it. I think he also has an Engineer Explosives on one that he can use. There's a lot going Ooh. on here. But you're right. Sahili, the play from Paul. Autumn Burchett wins game two. So all three of our game matches here going to three. Down to the wire. Aaron hoping that one of his teammates can get a win. Right now, Dominic trying to find a shock. Everyone just making sure all the tokens stay straight. We know it has summoning sickness and so forth. Complicated deck. Players of the four carry legacy challenge. Your parents for your best round. You're being posted at the gathering point. Engineered explosives here. More servos and thopters. We go back to our match here. And yeah, the engineer explosives can remove the blocker uh, and uh, copy what you know, uh, uh, copy of the construct, swing on in. So Harvey was hoping to top deck a burn spell, and Paul Muller took that top deck away. Yeah, it felt like he really just did everything he could to try and give himself that shot, and it wasn't in the cards to get that shot. Which means it's gonna come down to the legacy table. Autumn Burchett versus Jonathan Joe. We have a teamer Delver mirror between the two. It's time for some classic 2012 magic. Team Delver. Man, that was back in the era where it was just the best deck in Legacy. Oh, yeah. And then people played other things and did not win as much. Yeah, there was Canadian Threshold where you weren't quite sure if it was the best thing you could do. And then Delver of Secrets came out and it was just the best thing you could do by such a comical margin. Yeah. I, of course, tried to beat it with combo decks, and then, you know, was, like, never particularly successful at it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, we're in the coverage booth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd win sometimes when my opponent didn't know what they were doing. That's the best I can claim against the deck. Oh, yeah, all of the cards in the Team or Delver deck, on their face, don't look that impressive. But when piloted perfectly, it's so, so powerful. No one, no one who's new to Magic looks at Days and goes, wow, what a powerful card. But that card could never exist in Modern today, or even Standard. Both players here actually incorporating some Throne of Eldraine to their deck. Both have registered Hex Drinker in their Team Redelver lists. Right, and that's just a one-drop that translates in a way similar to Nimble Mongoose, but it's a better against Graveyard Hate, and it's better in the first, say, three, four turns of the game. For you see, two power is more <laughs> than oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> How much more? Uh, you're the math guy. I don't know. <laughs> Being so, able to grow out of range of swords to plowshares is one of the big... Or yeah. Having Nimble Mongoose dodge swords to plowshares is one of the big draws to the card in the first place. And the card basically grows to being something that can't die to Fatal Push, Swords to Plowshares, and what have you anyway. What I'm interested in is Hexdrinker good in this matchup. A lot of times, like, these one-drops, you know, Delvers and the such, aren't great in Delver Mirrors. Yeah, it can be pretty rough because they aren't giving you any kind of real advantage, but you do need something to be able to try and win the game with. The big issue with Hexdrinker in particular is it is kind of embarrassing against the card Rinnen 6. We kind of talked about those team strategies we mentioned earlier. 
On Job's side, his teammate Paul Muller watching on. On Autumn's side, uh, their teammate shook hands and walked away. <coughs> yeah, we saw Harvey just say, you know what, I trust my teammate. Autumn is a Team Redelver master and would rather just let things play out. There's certainly a point where time can even be a consideration. 15 minutes might be more than enough time if someone gets clowned out of the game, but if there's a full game of Legacy that's incredibly decision intensive, then it may end up taking every second of the clock in order to resolve it. Joe shaking his head here. He's already taken um, one mulligan. It's not the matchup where you want to take two. No, being down two resources is just so rough. And this is one where he's on the play as well, which means in some ways he's already down two resources. Yeah, yeah this is actually a matchup where play draw, it's not as clear. Right. And on exactly the first turn, there are some draws where being on the play is just everything. Right. If you can develop a Delver, have a day's backup, it's just going to define the match. But if you don't have exactly that draw, there are sometimes it's even favorable to go second. Right. And kind of see on John Job's body language, he doesn't have one of those super powerful starts. Oh, right. No one is uh, shaking their head at, oh, he's already on five. He's already down to five. Okay. It looks like he's on five already. Well, we will get things going. John Job starts off. Fetches for a volcanic island. In a Delver Mirror, when your opponent's on five from the other side of it, does it change how you play it? Sometimes you might be a bit more aggressive in trying to reduce your opponent's resources rather than develop your own. This is a spot where you might just fire off a wasteland on one, where you might have been more conservative in that de with that decision otherwise. From Joe, it has a turn one Delver of Secrets. He does have a daze to back it up. It looks like a daze, and then one and maybe two other lands. I think I see it's Flooded Grove Renin 6. That's not a bad place that to be. That is not bad at all. No. What if it... So, Job's a, a poker ringer. What if, that's if the hand all shakes, of that head yeah. shaking is just posturing? I was going to say, if, if that's his hand, is two lands, Renin 6, Days, Delver. That is quite a head shake before you keep that five. Oh, yeah. Look, some people are just upset that it, they only yeah. get to keep five of them. I only have this turn one threat and then a really powerful two drop to buy back all those cards I'm putting away, plus a free counter spell. You know, I guess. Sometimes it's a beat. Volcanic Island from Autumn. They bolt down the Delver of Secrets. Job's pausing here. Might want to daze. Yeah, it is Ren and Six, but he chooses to daze here. Right, and it looks like it's a misty rainforest and not a flooded grove. Ooh, okay. So, if Job's under the assumption that even a Ren and Six won't be able to get him back into this game, then he just needs to be the aggressor and try to get Autumn dead. So that's why you were seeing him protect yeah. this insect elaboration. There was a transform off of a brainstorm, so his hand now brainstorm. Fetch land, Ren and Six. It's not bad at all. And Autumn attacked down to 16. They have their own waterlogged grove. It's going to be Pyroblast. And this is what we were talking about before, how Autumn is just heavily prioritizing reducing resources. Yes, make sure every trade actually happens. You see, they're playing around days right now, making their land drops ahead of time. You know, if, if things trade, Autumn will have more cards at the end. Right, and I really like this brainstorm from Basoko, even though normally you don't really want to do them in spots like these. But the idea is he wants to try and get Autumn to pull the trigger on something like a counter spell in order to pave the way for his Rin and Six. Post brainstorm resolves, and the Delver's shot down. Now Autumn follows up with a Ponder. Oh, is that a daze? They could certainly use one here. Daze would be incredible against this Renin 6, which you have to imagine it's on yeah. Autumn's radar. It's a mirror match after all. Yeah, it would be on their radar. There would be the question as to what the other two cards are, right? If the other two cards are 
mopey or not what you're looking for, it's a big price to not shuffle here. Mm -hmm. That's true. And they do draw, and it is days. To Job we go. Brainstorm, land, Renin 6. Looks like he might have a Tarmogoyf hiding out in there. So the question is, which two drop does, does he lead on? Looks like it's going to start by trying for the Tarmogoyf. That's the one up at the front. Which one's the better one? Which one does he want to resolve? So more than likely, he wants to resolve Renin 6 because it does accrue advantage over a while. And if it feels like that's what he needs to do at this point is just get off the ground, get more right. raw cardboard in his hand, that's a way to accomplish it. And I have, what about this play by Autumn? They let it resolve. Major show of patience on Autumn's part. And it might just be that... Oh, is that a submerge in Autumn's there hand? There we go. And this they now have it's a removal spell for it. It all makes sense. The timing on the submerge is going to be interesting here. You, of course, can put it on top of the deck now or let Job draw ran the top card. Right, and you more than likely want to do it now just because it closes off some of his avenues of doing anything. So Tarmogoyf on top, Tarmogoyf of their own, and a pass. At this point, if you're on Job's side, you really don't expect a daze to come. No. No, you kind of gave a great target for it. Autumn didn't take the bait. But you can't just play yeah. out a Renin 6 into a Tarmogoyf that kills it. Well, and I love the read here on Autumn's side. It's the s letting this resolve and submerging it. You really have to suss out that your opponent does not have a third mana to make that play. Because I think when Job goes for the recast of Tarmogoyf, I wouldn't be surprised if Autumn dazes it the second time. Right. There's almost a point where that submerge was literally time lock. Yeah. And this is... It's subtle, but it's some really strong reads. And just, you know, Autumn walked him down this line over the course of two turns. Right. And it's the kind of thing where even in, if you're in Job's spot, what are you supposed to do differently? At least from the right, context right, yeah. that he has available. He likely has a read that there's something, right? Autumn probably isn't just submerging for no reason before deploying their own Tarmogoyf. Right. So yeah, it wouldn't make sense. You'd wait. Exactly. But then there's a wild leveling system involved of going, well, does Autumn just want me to think that? And so forth. Joe with his own Tarmogoyf. And now the days comes out. And this is so strong because... Autumn took the opportunity to make their own Tarmogoyf, which now meant the Ren and Six in Job's hand doesn't even matter. If he'd gone for that, it would have resolved. Right, and, you know, there's a spot where this is the bread and butter of Delver decks. You play a threat, and then you just keep your opponent right. on the back foot every turn while you four them, and then you four them, or you three them, and so on, and you just try to answer whatever they do that actually impacts the battlefield. And, and now Autumn's just gotten a great spot. They have the Tarmogoyf, they have more lands, they have a second Tarmogoyf in hand. It should be a situation that'll close out. Yeah, absolutely. Tarmogoyf is just so commanding here. Four damage in, Job to 15. Yeah, and Job's hand just isn't... Brainstorm and Renin 6 aren't going to be able to deal with another Tarmogoyf. Right, and it looks like Autumn's kind of weighing if they want to play out this Volcanic Island to cast Tarmogoyf, or if they want to fetch in order to have a Volcanic Island in their hand to put back with something like a Brainstorm later down the line. It's going to be the fetch. Remember, the, 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 the round rides on this match. And it is just second Tarmogoyf. Chet cast that, ponders, maybe to find another days, some some sort of way to seal this up. It looks like it's three lands, but two of them are wastelands. That it's quite tempting here. And it feels like Autumn yeah. this is Autumn's way of saying that's not how I lose this game. And I, I like that. Mana doesn't matter. I have two Tarmogoyfs to my opponent's two cards in hand and two lands. Wasteland is not 
preventing it's, me from losing this game. It's not about taking away Job's lands. I mean, it's that Job doesn't. It's not that Job doesn't have mana. It's that he doesn't have the right cards to cast. Right. Top three. Job finds another Renin six, a Hydro Blast, and a Fetch Land. Nothing that can Oof. save him on this board. No, not at all. And this is so much pressure here. Because there's even a point where if you play out a Renin 6, Autumn might just counter it if they have a counter spell in order to put a Planeswalker in the graveyard because that would put, <laughs> oh, no. that would put Job down to 5 with this Tarmogoyf swing. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually just a pump spell. Right. Yeah, I mean, Job has to keep the fetch land because these cards don't win, so he needs to shuffle the library. That's what he's going to do. I suppose you cast Renin 6 here. As opposed to not casting it? It's tough. You might just be in a spot where you think you need to brainstorm those cards back instead of just putting a gain four life spell down on the battlefield. Okay. Cast Ren and six. I guess he has to buy back a fetch land this right, way. Right. That's true. But he has to be careful about cracking those fetch lands. These, it does take a turn away from on the Tarmogoyf clock. Right now it's eight damage in play. A ponder from Autumn. You check the well, top three. A force of will here seems like you've got to it is correct. Yeah, you're probably yeah. just keeping a force of will because that is what checks the box of yeah. not dying this game. And I like what Autumn can do here. Both these turn are four power. Uh, they get to attack the Renin Six and attack Job. Job goes to ten, and now the, both the Goyfs are fives. Right. It's and very clean. Exactly. Force blue card and a lethal board. There's even a point where they might just go upstairs. And that's a, that's Who what cares about a Renin 6? Sure. That's what they do. Job down to 6. Wasteland pick up Hydro Blast, and two lands that's is not, not going to do, do it. it. And there's the hand. So Autumn Burchett does pick up the second win for their team. And team of Burchett, Harvey, and Barrett winning. <laughs> <laughs> Walking by us here is Dom Harvey, <laughs> clear on the other side hey, of the room. That is Dab Harvey. Just, 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 just heard us reaction. announce it and then reacted like, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they advance to five and one here with three rounds to play. Uh, all three of those matches are actually coming down to the wire. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, every game went to three.